Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Neil Henriksen. I'm an entrepreneur. I have a company called Koi Strategy, which is why you see the fish there. Does anybody know the story about the koi fish? If you put a koi fish in a very small pond, it will always stay a very small fish. But if you put it into a large pond, it will grow out to being a much bigger fish. So my job in life is I work at startups right up and down the whole length and breadth of South Africa. And I'm helping them to take them from small fish out to very much larger fish by showing them new possibilities, big, bigger and deeper horizons. So does everybody here this afternoon want to be an entrepreneur? This is a bit depressing. I, I only see about three hands. What are the rest of you going to do? Work for Sun Lama Old Mutual? You're not sure. Post office, possibly. <laughs> a lot of opportunities there in Paris Tattles. All right, so how many of you are 19? Hands up. Right, you're the same age as I was when I started with my first startup. I was studying at UCT at the time. And I had the chance to join a small, struggling startup, which was just all of three other people at the time. Two German brothers, much older than me, and a receptionist. And they were battling. So I started out with these folk, and that was my first startup. And it would take 16 years before I sold that company. That startup was the type where you start out with virtually nothing, and you slowly bootstrap it up, all the way growing bigger and bigger and bigger, until 16 years later, I sold it to Data Tech, one of the giants on the stock exchange. Then I took a two-year sabbatical. I moved to Neisner, which is where I'm currently based. Became a Christian, involved in youth ministry, working with small kids. And then one day I got a phone call from a colleague, and he said to me, I'm doing a new startup. I want you to come and join me. I said, no ways. Done one. That's enough for a lifetime. And he said, no, no, he's a very uh, persuasive person, Hannes van Rensburg, and he said, I will fly to Neisner to convince you. And he did. We sat down, we spent a whole day brainstorming and writing notes, and I, I don't, I'm not, I've never been addicted to cocaine, but I imagine it's a similar thing that once you're addicted to entrepreneurship, right, you know, that gets into the blood. So the day after I turned 40, we started a new company. We called it Kariba, because Hannes had just come back from fishing on the Kariba Dam. And he had a very simple revolutionary idea then, it was a very new idea in 1999, is to do mobile payments from one phone to another phone. The company grew, and that company was a dot-com type startup. In other words, we took off very rapidly, fueled not by steroids, but by venture capital. In 18 months, we went through 60 million rand of other people's money. Blew up to a very large staff, had to cut back again, and then blew up some more. After about two years of helping to run that company, I decided to go back to Plan A, which was doing more work with communities and people, because the job had got back to being what a startup always is, 12 to 15 hour days, nonstop, six days a week with an enormous amount of traveling. I didn't want to spend the next 10 years of my life doing that. My partner stayed on as CEO of the company, some of the other core staff stayed on, and 10 years later, they sold that company. By then it was 250 people for 700 million rand. So both types of startups I've been involved with, small and slow, 16 years to ramp up, and then very quick ramp up, and then it took quite a while before that company exited. Now with this work with startups in Cape Town to the Bandwidth Barn, I'm going to be doing more and more work with you folk here at the university, I hope. I work with the University of Pretoria, I work with the Innovation Hub there, I work with companies and organizations like the CSIR to commercialize research. So I get to see an awful lot of startups. I work with startups all the day time. I see probably about 100 to 150 startups every year that I work with, sometimes just in a one-off session of coaching, sometimes more involved uh, work. So I see a lot of bad ideas. So I'm here this afternoon to help you avoid some of those bad ideas and give you some guidelines to how you find a good idea for a new venture. But first, a quick lightning tour of the two halves of my brain. Uh, on the left-hand half, as I mentioned, I do strategy work. 
So I'm helping startups and helping them take them up to the next level by doing big conceptual strategy work with them. On the right-hand side of my brain, I also consult to big companies on branding issues around how to tell a convincing and very in, um, compelling story around the brand and the idea that you have. Because you can have the best idea in the world, but if nobody gets excited about it, nobody wants to join you, give you money, buy things from you, that's worthless. I'm going to be running the first of my three-day idea workshop starting this weekend here at Marty's on Saturday. It's a three-day workshop. We're just doing the first day this particular Saturday. In a month's time, in March, we'll be doing the second day and the third day. The first day is mostly around the other half of my brain. So that is the strategy side. We're going to be looking in depth at the topic I'm talking on today. Then on the second day in March, we're going to be taking the idea that you've developed, and I'm going to show you all the lessons I've learned over 35 years. Yes, I'm 54. That's how long I've been doing this on how to monetize that idea, market that idea, protect it from getting stolen, and how to scale it up from a small idea to a very large idea very quickly. And then on the last of those three days, which I think is scheduled for April, We'll be turning to the other side of my brain, and I'll be teaching you all the lessons I teach big corporates about how to come up with a compelling brand and identity that gets people excited about the venture that you're doing. So, enough of all of that, Gump. Let's get straight to it. My simple formula for startups is that finding a great idea is going to be the intersection between a real need out in the world and some new technology or business model. The important thing is that you start with a real need in the real world. The number one problem I have, especially with techies, come on, which of you are techies? Put your hands up. Whoa, nobody wants to own up to being, did you have your hand up? Ah, oh, you're just adjusting your glasses. Yeah, she's a sort of closet techie because she sort of put her half hand up and then it went down again. It's a bit like one of my friends a while ago. We had a visiting pastor in our church. Our pastor would never do this, but this guy started out the sermon by saying, he said, he said, can I ask you, he says, which of you have bought a lottery ticket in the last month? My friend Jeff, who's a keen follower of the lottery, immediately stuck his hand up and then looked around in church and noticed, Hayden, he buys them all the time. He buys... Nobody else had their hand up. Yes, yeah. So... Uh, <laughs> Foolish thing, sticking your hand up first. So, if you're a techie, and you know who you are, those of you not aim, uh, owning up to be techies, I see our people pointing in the back row, thank you, identifying, outing some techies here, is that what you will tend to do is come up with a brilliant idea around some new piece of technology that you want to play with. And then you think to yourself, wow, this is so exciting, augmented reality, or this, or that. And we're going to be covering lots of these new technologies on Saturday. But they start there. And then they think, I want to play with this. How can I turn this into a business? And who can I sell this to? That's the wrong approach. All right? Because you're going out trying to sell people something they don't need. But if you start with a real need, one of the big advantages is that you won't have to do a lot of marketing then. You see, if you make something that people already want, all you have to do is tell them that it's there and how much it costs. So, a simple example. I mentioned I live in Neisner. I'm blessed to live near some farmland. In the mornings, you stand there shaving, listening to cows mooing. It's very rustic. Flip side is lots of flies if you're next to farmland. Which of you are farmers? Farming? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, you know what I'm talking about. So, one day I'm sitting at a friend's house. Also, there's a fly buzzing around here reaches over and he picks up what looks like a tennis racket. He just goes, zip! You seen those fly zapper things? Some of you? Well, it's like a tennis racket and it's got all these little wires on it. touches a fly or anything. They're just atomized. So I looked at the thing. I said, whoa! He said, that's amazing. Where do you get that? He said, any of these Chinese stores on the main road? About 50 bucks. I said, thank you very much. The next morning I'm there to buy one. You see, I've got a real need. You don't have to sell me on the damn thing. All I have to know is, where can I buy it? How much does it cost? Can I afford it? If you've got a real need, people really want this, your marketing is taken care of. You need a lot of marketing when you're trying to sell people something they don't understand and they don't need. So it's going to be intersection of that real need, and then 
if we just know the need but we don't know how to meet it, so you're going to take then tools of either being a new technology that allows you to find an innovative new way to solve that need or a new business model. I'll give you some examples of both as we go through the rest of the talk. But first of all, I want to scope back a bit and ask how would Buddha come up with a new idea? Which of you know the story about Buddha? Nobody? Good. All right. Uh, <laughs> as a Christian, I can say that. The story about the Buddha is that he was a very privileged, wealthy young man. And he lived in a large compound in India by his family, and he never went outside. It was a very large estate, and he lived in this estate. He had the best of everything. He was the eldest son. He was a prized person. So in his life, until his 20s, he never saw any problems or anything. He was shielded from that. But then, prompted by who knows what, one day he left the estate and he went out into the rest of the world. If you've seen pictures of India and the poverty over there, it hasn't changed much in, in millennia. He was shocked. There were sick people, dying people, filth, disease, Ill, uh, no education, prejudices, hatreds. And that was a wake-up club for him. And out of that became his philosophy, a detachment from the world which we know as Buddhism. But it only started when he went off the estate. So mixed metaphors with India, with Red Indians. He had to go out there and find all of those problems. So what would the Buddha's ver uh, journey be today? Well, it might start where I live. That's Nisna. Which of you have been to Nisna? Let's do it the other way. Which of you haven't been to Nisna? Why not? <laughs> okay? We need your money in our town. It's a small town and we rely on tourism. For those who haven't, coming up for Easter, get your butts up to Neisner and spend lots of money, please. If you started out in Neisner, then you might end up as a tourist at our waterfront, which is enormous. It can take you all of five minutes from, to walk from one side to the other on a windy day. So here you'd be in this luxurious environment with all these huge, beautiful 70, 80, 50 million rand yachts moored around you. That. But what do you see right up at the top of the slide off to the right over there? Up there in the ridge in this snap you see some of the houses. Those are still from the more affluent suburbs. But if you went just a little bit further, there at the top you start seeing all the shacks, all the RDP houses. What does it look like for the people who live on the other side of that ridge? Well, here we are on the other side. You can just see over the top, right over there, a bit of the lagoon looking over. But now we've gone over to the other side where the other people live. That building over there with the green arrow next to it is the Greenfields Church, where I help run a large church for township children. These youngsters spend their lives just in this space. That's their soccer field. We're looking down from the church into that. They're doing the day. They're doing the night. We live in a divided society in that they very seldom leave here. It's expensive to get taxis. You can walk into town, but it's a long walk, and it's all over that hill and then all the way down, quite steeply and back up again. So these kids live out most of their lives over here. There's a real lack, of course, many of the kids are growing up without fathers and in very poor and poor circumstances. There are good schools in Neisner, but they're very crowded. This is Percy and Dala, one of up until recently the only course of medium school in the area, built for 1,000 students, currently with 1,600 students. So when you go and spend some time in their computer lab, they do have one, you stand because they're perpetually short of chairs. And the computer lab is non-essential, so there are no chairs inside there. What we're talking about over here is not just something particular to South Africa. The base of the pyramid, BOP, the base of the pyramid, 60%, 4 billion people live there on less than $2 per day. That's the bulk of the world's population. So that is where we have a lot of the problems 
and where there are problems, there are opportunities inside our country. Let me put it to you another way. That's the United States. If we look at the United States, and we take the squares being the population, most of the people in the United States are relatively affluent. It's the richest nation on earth. At the bottom over here, we have the people living in poverty. By their own definition in America, that's 15% of the population. Quite big, considering it's the wealthiest country in the world. But 15% of the population. Now go and look at South Africa. You can just reverse that, and we'll have about 15% of the population at best living in the circumstances that most of you probably do, of relative affluence and ease, and 85% of the population living largely like the slides that we just saw. Yet, despite this, and the huge part of the population here, which has got a lot of buying power, surprisingly, a lot more than you'd think, and the real needs there, Time after time, when I sit down with entrepreneurs and I say, what is your idea to change the world? They will come up with some scheme that is targeted 100% squarely at Woolworths shoppers. Which of you shop at Woolworths? I'll see the hands coming up like you are. <laughs> all right, it's okay to own up to that that you shop at Woolworths, but still. All right, that's for the privileged part of the world. So, application after application aimed at 15% of our population. How many other people are selling things to the people who shop at Woolworths? Everybody wants to go there. Nobody wants to go down to this section over here, but this is where opportunities are. Here's another way of thinking about it, is that you tend to find opportunities and possibilities where things are hard and gritty. So let me give you two examples. First of all, some of my family, part of my family, emigrated a few years ago to Canada. They went to a small town, or not that small, called Whistler. It's north up north of Vancouver. It is the top skiing resort town in North America. 7,000 acres of beautiful, glorious snow. To ski, that's skiable. When they went there, my stepmother had been in real estate all of her life, and they thought, what kind of job, what kind of business can we start there? They went on an uh, immigration thing that said you had to start a business. They thought, right, doing rentals. People come in and out of Whistler all the time on holiday to ski for a week or two. So they imagined themselves, her and her husband, sitting inside a nice, warm, toasty office, with a big screen there and a nice view out the window, nice and warm, taking phone calls like this. Good afternoon, yes, we have a wonderful unit right next to the ski lift, only $500 per day, can I book you from this Sunday? Well, that wasn't going to happen. It's like estate agents in South Africa before the crash. Six million people thought of the same idea. So what work would there be inside Whistler that nobody wants to do? Because it's not glamorous sitting indoors answering the phone. Think about it. Several thousand apartments, people coming and going all the time. What needs to get done? Thank you? Cleaning. cleaning. Yes, that's not glamorous, but cleaning. All those apartments have to be cleaned all the time. And that's what they ended up doing. They ran a quite a big business. They ended up with 40 people working for them, going around cleaning apartments. Six, seven days a week. Hard work out in the minus 10 degrees temperature in winter, which is when people come to ski, not so? But very lucrative. Nobody else wants to do it. They made a lot of money running that business. So an example closer to home. A few years ago, I have a young Muslim lady, or not so young, she'd been in her mid-30s, come to me, and she had developed a set of training materials for Microsoft Office. So I said to her, I looked through these training materials, beautiful manuals, this, that, tutorials, everything. I said, is it CETA, theta, whatever else qualified? Tick in the box, all cleared, tax break from government for this training material. I said, how are you doing with this? She said, I'm failing abysmally. I can't get any customers. I said, who are you trying to get? She said, well, I'm going into trying to get into Old Mutual and Sunlum and this and the next big company, and I'm getting nowhere. So I went through with her, first of all, with any idea, you want to find what pain is it really solving. So, which of you have done a course on Microsoft Word? One or two people, but really, there isn't a big need for it. It's not that complicated. 
They're fancy features in Word, but most of us will never do all of those fancy superscript, subscript, page mergers, table of content type of stuff you need to go on a course for. Take that off the table. PowerPoint, anybody can slap together stuff like this. Not a big need to go on a course. Excel, which of you can take six Excel spreadsheets and consolidate them like that down and then merge it across? Exactly. All right, so I said to her, spreadsheets are your real pain point. Who needs spreadsheets and expertise in this? I said, well, all those big corporates. I said, yeah, but everybody else is calling on those big corporates. They have their own internal training departments, their consultants in there. I said to her, you want to go and sell lots of this? Go and start out where I started out when I was not much older than you guys with my first business. I said, go to Salt River Circle just off the CBD and go out in any direction along there, Maitland, Epping, Industria, what you will find is lots of factories. When you go in those factories, they're dirty, they're noisy, they're messy, they're chaos. But there's some young lady called Shahida there with an old computer who's got to do all the spreadsheets. You see, factories run on numbers. I said, go and visit all those places. None of the yuppies are going to those factories with their training material because when they come out, their hubcaps will be gone from their 4x4, four four, okay? So they don't want to go there. But you go there and you will find a whole lot of opportunities. I know because in my 20s I went there and I signed up lots of those factory owners for my first company services. They were quite surprised when somebody walked in to sell them something. Nobody visited them. Open playing field, no competition. So now I want to take you on a very quick lightning tour through where some of these opportunities are in South Africa. And we're going to do this compliments of Trevor Manuel. Thank you, Trevor, because his National Planning Commission, appointed by the government, has spent a number of years coming up with a report that was released two years ago, three years ago, called the National Planning Commission Diagnostic Report that pinpoints what the nine biggest areas of problems are inside South Africa. And in every one of those areas, there are going to be opportunities. Sorry, is there a sound clip here? Sound thing to plug in the side. Ah, missed that one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trevor Mandel. I'm the chairperson of in South Africa. This is the first planning commission we've had in the country. It was set up by President Zuma and inaugurated in May of 2010. The president invited the planning commission to take an independent and critical view of South Africa and use this to produce a vision and a plan focused on the details of a much better quality of life for all by 2030. The commission is made up of 26 commissioners, 25 are private citizens who serve in their part-time capacities, and I'm the cabinet minister and the only full-time commissioner. Our first task was to get a clear picture of where we are as a country. The commission wrote a diagnostic report which we shared with the country in June of this year. The feedback from this is that we've done a good job describing the problems that face us in I'm going to talk about what we find in a bit more detail shortly. The second task that we've been set is to draw a vision and a plan that will take us to 2030. Our focus is on eliminating poverty and reducing inequality. I want to emphasize that. We have to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality because we believe that these are the two biggest problems that face us as a country. And because these problems are so big, they affect everything else. So let me share our findings with you 
uh, in the diagnostic report. We identified nine big challenges that we think are the most urgent. These were a poor educational outcome. Secondly, too few South Africans are uh, employed. Thirdly, the country has a very high disease burden. Fourthly, we are still a divided society. Fifth, public services are very poor. And there are parts of the country where people are locked into poverty where they live. Infrastructure is crumbling. And we do not use our natural resources such as land and water well. And we release too much carbon into the atmosphere. Corruption bedevils everything we do. I would like to talk about each of these in a little more detail. If you start with education, which is the basis of everything, we have some things we need to be thankful for. 80% of learners age five enrolled at school. That looks good. But digging deeper, we see that the shadow of history as defined by race and class is still very evident in our education. Only 1% of African schools are top performing, 12% are moderately performing, and 87% of schools serving the African majority perform poorly. South Africa is ranked 139th in the world when it comes to literacy and numeracy skills of learners at grades three and six. This is carried through from these grades into high school and beyond. But clearly, we, we see that our grade 12 pass rates are very, very poor. The second issue that you know, confronts us is that two views of Africa. So let's stop there and talk about education for a moment. This is a massive problem inside our country. You saw those snaps of what it looks like to be in, uh, in a school that doesn't have enough facilities. So I said to you that once you identify a problem, the next step is to look at new technologies that could be used to solve it and new models. One, of course, new technologies that increasingly we have got mobile phones or smartphones in everybody's hands. Smartphones, where people can browse the internet, are coming down in price all the time. Nokia is planning to release a smartphone next year, a very basic one, based on Mozilla Firefox, for those of you who know browsers, for $25. That's right, just under 300 Rand for a touchscreen smartphone. So these are going to become accessible to the poorest of the poor. More than that, we're going to see tablets as well. Your our iPads are going to also be reaching out to those poorer segments, which will be a way of getting information to them. Now, when I talk about tablets appearing inside townships, people go, yeah, sure. But let me take you back in history. It's 1999. Hannes and I have just started the company, and we're on our way in Johannesburg to go and visit somebody who's a potential investor. We're driving through Santon, a wealthy suburb, and it's a quiet Wednesday morning. There's nobody on the road, and as we go down the one road, we go past a large lady who's in a uniform. She's clearly a domestic servant, and she's talking away animatedly on a cell phone. Now, you're too young to remember this, but I can tell you in 1999, cell phones were very new in South Africa. They were very expensive. Lots of my friends still didn't have them. And Hannes and I, we actually stopped the car and we looked around. Hannes said, did you see that? A domestic servant with a cell phone. We're clearly in the richest suburb inside South Africa. It was remarkable. Domestic servants. Cell phones were very expensive in those days. Fast forward to today, every domestic, cell phone, every domestic servant's 10-year-old child has got a cell phone today. It's going to be the same thing for tablets. It might seem unbelievable today, but tablets will come down to very affordable. You can walk into Musica right now, and they're running a special Android tablet, 7-inch, all the uh, mod cons, 999. If it's retailing at 999 in Musica, I can tell you it'll come down even more over the next few years, and eventually you'll be able to get a basic entry-level tablet for about six, seven, eight hundred rand. What does a tablet replace? Sorry? Laptop is what I hear very quietly from over there. Tablet replacing laptop. That's what we tend to think, because we're used to laptops, and we think this is, is just a smaller laptop. No, it's not. For the poorer people, the tablet is going to be the poor person's television. 
all right? Because it solves a lot of problems for that demographic. One of which is that you can't often lock up where you live. Have you ever seen a poor person, a, a, somebody who works as a gardener or that, walking to work wearing a very smart jacket? Why are they doing that? Because they live in a shack. Everybody where they live knows they own that smart jacket. It's maybe the most expensive thing they own. If they leave it in their shack during the day, it's only a few large kicks to knock the shack down to get to it. You can't lock up anything securely, so you go to work with your prized jacket on so that it can't be stolen while you're away. In a similar way, you can't lock up a television, but you can take this with you. Electricity inside townships is always dicey, but you can take this with you, and just as domestic servants often say, may I charge my phone while I'm working? May I charge and leave my tablet inside the house while I'm doing your garden? That's another factor, so that you've got a long viewing life over here without electricity. People who live in townships are transient. You will stay with a relative for a while, move somewhere else here. The tablet goes with you. And how do people in the township get music today? It's very simple. You drop your cell phone off with somebody at, one of, uh, at a corner spaza or inside a container somewhere, and you leave 50 rand with them, and you come back and get 2,000 songs on your cell phone. That's how it works. It will become the same way for movies, like it or not Hollywood. So the tablet is going to become ubiquitous as the poor person's television. And you'll see it all over in townships. That's an opportunity because now we have something in people's hands where we can send them lessons and tasks. So that's the technology, but that plays into a new model and way of doing things. Who here has heard of the flipped classroom? It's not what the classroom looks like on Monday morning after a weekend of parting. Flip classroom? No. All right, so here's how things normally work. Is that during the day, I go to classes and I listen to a lecture, somebody like me, sit there, lots of us, listening to a lecture droning on and teaching us about something. And then at night time, I will go home and I will sit at my table with my books and study and do my homework. So that's the normal model. Daytime, go to the lectures. All of us flood over here, walk, cycle, drive, if you're lucky, to get here, pack into a theater, listen to somebody teaching us, go home and do the work. What, what if we flip that? See, the flip model says, what about if at nighttime I sit here and I watch on my tablet the best lecturer in the world teaching me stuff. All right? So not me, somebody much better than me, much more interesting than me, better looking as well. All right? So we watch the best lecturer in the world explaining this at nighttime instead of doing the daytime. We don't all have to flood in and crowd out a huge big lecture theater like this. Then in daytime, what we would do is then go to university, sit with some of our friends around the table like we do in the library at the moment, work on our work, but with a lecturer or somebody there to help us and give us input into what we're studying. So you can see all these advantages is that best lecture in the world. Now I can actually, when I do the work, I've got somebody nearby who can uh, uh, guide me through all of this. And this model, delivered via tablets, can start working for people inside townships. This is also part of this move around the world to MOOCs, MOOCs, massively online uh, courses, where thousands of people can do the same course at the same time. So new technologies and new models and ways of doing things can offer us solutions inside the education space. And that's a very exciting space to be playing in today. Many more people come into the workforce every year and there are jobs available. This means that young people are bearing the brunt of unemployment. 60% of people who are unemployed have never actually worked a day in their lives. I speak to you, as I speak to you, our official unemployment statistic is 25.7%. On top of that, many workers lack the skills that will help us to modernize this great economy. So again, this is pointing to something where not just school learners, but people out over there getting skills. 
So what does somebody, poor people spend a lot of time traveling, taxis, train, etc. What does somebody who wants to become a plumber, instead of doing a nine-month apprenticeship, if we could cut that down to three months? Before they enter the apprenticeship on their mobile phone or their tablet, they get a whole series of short five-minute videos that explains what all the tools are that you use as a plumber, how to take the water level for a house, all of those things. You watch those things over and over, Again, in your native language, if you're doing it for a large audience, we can easily afford to do it for all 11 languages, which you're at ease in. And when you start your apprenticeship, half the work that we'd have to teach somebody on an apprenticeship has already been done. Do something about this, there is no choice. The third challenge is infrastructure. We haven't spent nearly enough on roads, and railways, ports, uh, energy, uh, for about a generation. We demonstrated that as a nation we could spend very well for the FIFA 2010 World Cup. But other than that, I don't get that power to switch on. Infrastructure. We're building two very big uh, power stations now, but we need to invest significantly more, um. especially in maintaining what we already so infrastructure is another huge problem that we have, and crumbling infrastructure that, um, sorry, we will need a solution because my battery's running low. I can plug in the side over there. All right, great. Uh, thanks. Switch it on? Yes, it is. Great. Thanks. So infrastructure is crumbling across South Africa. We haven't invested in things for years. So one good example is, who rides the train regularly? One person. Right, so one of the entrepreneurs that I coach uh, is Justin Kutsia, who has a startup called Go Metro. Anybody heard of it? One person, nobody else. What this does is he was a student studying here at Stellenbosch to do his uh, master's as an engineer in, a, in, uh, in public transit. He's riding the trains because he lives in Cape Town every single day to come through to study. And what he notices is that, what a shocker, the trains don't leave on time. Sometimes they don't leave at all. This might seem like a small irritation to you, but this happens so much because South Africa's rail infrastructure is so poor, so outdated, and so falling apart, that it happens a lot of the times. Now, if you're poor, your train leaves an hour late. You get to work late. You are on a time card system. You are docked for that. Two hours, an hour here, two hours there. So you stand on the station and you worry. Your train isn't there and you think to yourself, I must either take a taxi, which will cost me more than the train fare, and then I'll really get to work late because taxis, stop, start, after robot, stop, start, da, da, da. It's going to take a long time to get there. Or I stand in the station and I stand a chance that the train won't turn up at all. And I won't turn up at all for work. As a result, around South Africa, every single month, at least four train carriages, if not complete trains, are burnt to the ground due to consumer rage. Because at the end of the month, you're a poor person getting by on eight or 9,000 rand, if that, a month, and you've had nearly 2,000 rand docked off your pay because you've been late just about every morning of the month. And rage explodes in and you burn the train to the ground. Metro Rail doesn't like people knowing those statistics. They try and cover them up, but that's happening all the time. This month alone, another four carriages will get burned to the ground. So Justin became aware of all of these, studying this, and most important, riding on the train. So he said, what can I do? We're going to look at the technologies on Saturday, but the combination of a mobile phone plus a big cloud of data at the back end, he went to Metro Rail and said, can I write an app that taps into all the data? You see, they know where all these trains are. They have to, otherwise they'd start colliding and going off the rails. They've got all that information in a switching computer at the back end. He said, I'll write an app, people can go and see that. So now the Metro Rail app allows you to see your train is running half an hour late, an hour late, whatever else, and you can plan accordingly. I need to take a taxi or work around something. We worked together and I said to him, when people plan their route on the app, get them to put their boss's email address in as well. Why? 
Thank you. Yes, because then the moment the trains are running late, automatically without that person doing anything, an email is generated going to his boss saying, Metro Rail South Africa would like to apologize that Mr. Ibrahim Sali will be late this, this morning for work due to problems on the A-line with uh, delays of up to an hour. So he gets to work, his boss has got the email. So this is a very powerful app. Now that app, that's a simple idea, all right? From there, Justin has launched out, and this has all been bootstrapped. He hasn't taken a cent of venture capital. His dad is an ex-IBMer, he's written most of the code. He's launched out to incorporate Golden Arrow, Rear Via, and the big BRTs and bus companies. This year it will get rolled out as Go Gauteng, the official public transit app for the entire province of Gauteng, including the car train and everything else in one app. And he's already been offered more than enough money to retire on for Go Metro. And that's bootstrap with just a handful of people working on it. It all started with a real problem inside South Africa's in infrastructure. You go and look at the infrastructure, there are a lot more problems. How do you drill down to find more about this? You go Google the National Planning Commission's development plan, 450 pages in depth on each one of these areas. Go look where the problems are, start putting your mind to how could somebody fix these things. Also, as we can talk about the potholes in our roads around the country, many South Africans are exposed to water schemes that aren't working and such problems. We have to uh, spend money on the maintenance of that infrastructure. You just mentioned water there. You will all remember the rolling blackout we had in South Africa a few years ago with, with ESCOM. And those are just the beginnings of problems. ESCOM still has many problems in front of it. But really, water is the next electricity. All right, if you think the problems with electricity have been bad, wait till the water shortages start cutting in. We're a little bit inured from this. We've got a fair amount of water in the Western Cape. But if you go to Kaoting, there the economy is growing and growing and growing dramatically. But not one drop extra of water will go into Gauteng for another 10 years. That's because the bulk of uh, Gauteng's water comes from Lesotho, from the Highlands Water Project. And in 2023, the new dams will come on tap over there, and there'll be a huge amount more water coming from the water project down to Gauteng. But for the next 10 years, not one drop more of water. Every year, the problem will get you worse and worse. More people in Gauteng, more buildings, more industry, same amount of water. It's not going to stretch. So what kind of opportunities will there be around that? Where do you find the ideas, the tools, the ideas for solving those things? You see, the nice thing about being an entrepreneur is you don't necessarily have to dream all this up yourselves and find it yourselves. You can go and steal it. Where would you go and steal good ideas for coping with water shortages? Other countries. Which ones? Which ones are short of water? and have good technology. Israel, thank you very much, yes. Israel is a good one, Australia is another one. So in Israel they've got fantastic technology for managing water because they live in a desert. Their survival relies on that. You go to Israel and you see how they handle water problems, what technologies they've got. You bring some of those back here and you bring them into South Africa before all those problems start hitting. Entrepreneurs see out ahead and move ahead of other people. Go to Australia and see what things they're doing there. If you live in Australia, you're taxed on the size of the roof of your house. You see, every house in Australia, and I think it's getting mandated in most provinces in South Africa, have to have a big water tank outside to capture the water coming from your roof. But let's say I've got a small house with a small roof, but my neighbor's got a big ranch-style house with a huge flat roof. He's capturing more water that water would otherwise be going into the water table. So he's going to pay significantly higher taxes because he's capturing water that otherwise would have gone into the water pool and be shared with everybody. You can see that's going to come to South Africa probably. And those type of things are going to need then regulations, water saving methods, all types of possibilities. People are going to be worrying about their water a lot. So right now I see an entrepreneur every week with an idea for an app that's going to manage your electricity in the house and be able to switch on and off the geyser and be able to monitor all from your iPad. Literally one a week. 
One of my lessons with entrepreneurs is don't skate where the puck is. Go and do something that nobody else is doing. Everybody's focusing on the electricity. Nobody's looking at the water. These patterns are still in place today. What this means is that poor people, especially the African poor, live in places that have very few rail links and other forms of public transport. A great many people who don't earn a lot also live very far from where they work. This must be corrected. Spatial patterns. Which of you go to the Somerset Mall to shop? Yes, okay. I see shoppers in the back row over there. Thank you. So if you go into the Somerset Mall, I live when I'm working in Cape Town out near Solari's village in a small holding with friends, so I quite frequently and I need to get things into the Somerset Mall, normally coming in the back way. If you drive into the back way to Somerset Mall, one of my friends who I'm often traveling with, always as we drove along, drive along the one section of road, says, these poor people... She's referring to the people living on the left-hand side of the road. That's a fairly affluent, middle-class, largely white suburb. They must have been all very happy there until the government put a whole lot of RDP houses on the other side of the road. So now this affluent suburb is looking across the road into a poor suburb of RDP houses. It's largely a dust bowl, not a, grass, a blade of green there. Naturally, crime goes up. It's aesthetically not so appealing to live just across the road from this. Higher crime, etc. Their property values have gone down the toilet. That's why she drives past and says, those poor people, they didn't know they'd get all those RDP houses opposite. Well, welcome to the future. This is mixed residential housing. This is mandated by the government for all new developments, and this is right. Otherwise, our country will always be the haves, and six miles away, the have-nots. We've got to start mixing it up if we're ever going to heal and move forward as a society. Otherwise, we'll always be split. So that is mandated. That's how it's going to be in the future. What are the opportunities here? Opportunities? So, let's look at the problem. This side over here, I've got a wealthy suburb that's looking into an aesthetically unappealing suburb over here and worrying about crime. This suburb, I'm actually living in that environment, but it's not that great, and my crime is even bigger. Crime in the townships is far more than crime inside suburbs. How could we come up with something that meets everybody thing and starts as an innovative solution and that starts bringing those communities together? What about if we address the root first problem of crime and we started putting together a security service, whatever, drawn from and only employing people who work in the poor community? So we then have a security service that patrols both suburbs. It's drawn from people who live in the community, so they'll be better at policing and knowing problem people. And if we took some of the profits from that and we poured those profits back into revitalizing and doing beautification projects for this suburb over here, then we have a win-win situation. We have us working together, drawing from local people. The money stays there and goes into doing gardens and other stuff to beautify this section, raises the value of both areas together. That is a type of innovative thinking around social problems that we're going to need inside South Africa. And the entrepreneurs who see those things first and start putting companies together around that will do very well. Not in least because there's a lot of government funding can draw down when you're doing innovative things like that from CSI, BEE, and other type of funds as well that you can draw on. So doing good is also good for the bottom line. Timing? Two minutes, okay, right. We're running a little short on time, and the next challenges that uh, Trevor Manuel addresses are largely around things like healthcare, which is where I tell entrepreneurs that's where startups go to die, because healthcare is a very difficult area. But I want to just cap up by saying lessons for our world. Start where it's hard. Start where it's gritty. Start where there are real problems. Don't go for the more affluent things. 
some resources for those of you who want to know more about these ideas. I have something called Koi Tips, WW Koi Tips. I write every other week a lesson for entrepreneurs about the opportunities in our country and how to go about harvesting those. So you can go and have a look over there. Thank you very much. All the information I spoke about, I'll put on Moodle.